Transvision 2022, organisé par l'Association française transhumaniste. Hello again. This time I have a few comments on the topic of existential risks. This is something that came up um, fairly recently really in transhumanist history. It wasn't a big issue in the early days. Our, our focus in the early days was really trying to get people to take these ideas seriously. The idea that we could actually radically extend the human lifespan, that we could augment intelligence and so on. Uh, the tendency, the, the uh, focus has shifted over the years. Now more people accept that. You know, people talk about artificial intelligence as something pretty much inevitable. And instead, the question is, what should we do about it? How should we try to control it? And so on. Uh, even in the era of space, of course, now we're getting back to saying, oh, it's happening again. So we don't have to convince people so much. The focus has really shifted towards what should we worry about with these technologies? Now, to some extent, that's a good thing, but I'm also a little concerned that we're going too far in that direction because there's plenty of critics out there who are already focusing on the risks and telling us we shouldn't be doing these things. So I'm a little bit wary of transhumanists themselves spending too much time on this. On the other hand, of course, if they don't, then the people who do the do spend time looking at the risks are probably going to exaggerate them and try to stop us. So uh, there's, a, there's a balance we have to achieve there. I'm also a little bit doubtful that there are real existential risks in the true sense of the term, or I've always preferred the term extinction risks. I think it's pretty hard to actually extinguish the entire human race. It's possible, but a much more likely scenario, uh, and it comes to essentially the same kind of concerns, is we could wipe out so much of the population that there's not much left, and it may be very difficult or impossible to actually resume a, a technological civilization, maybe you know, bomb back to the Dark Ages. Uh, to me, that, that's essentially uh, the, the more likely issue, but in practice, it's not really a lot different because we're still talking about the same mechanisms. Um, and from my point of view, from my selfish point of view, if, if I'm extinct, then that's a pretty bad situation. Whether or not everybody's extinct or just 90% of people doesn't make that much difference. Um, so let's look at from that, that point of view with that kind of understanding. Um, so that 90% is, is pretty much as bad as 100%, especially if you're one of the, the 90. Um, which ones, which issues are my main concerns? Well, this may seem pretty obvious today, but it's not new for me to have this view. But I think that uh, disease, plagues, pandemics is actually the largest risk. And again, there's not something I thought just since COVID, because COVID was relatively mild, but it was certainly a wake-up call. That's something I thought for a long time. Just thinking about the plagues of the past, which wiped out a third uh, or more of Europe, and uh, other plagues throughout history, which have wiped out large numbers of people and could easily take down our technological civilization, uh, both natural plagues and even more concerning design plagues. We've already seen you know, how bad just a fairly mild disease is, um, you know, for most people fairly mild. Imagine we had something much worse, something like a Ebola or something worse than that, which is also highly transmissible. It could be a, a huge disaster, extremely bad could potentially destroy our working civilization. So I think that has to be priority number one to me, uh, because it is actually quite likely and a major concern, not something very science fictional. Um, we need to focus on building better tools for detection and rapid response, being able to design solutions better. So a lot of, and because we're starting to do that now with uh, antibiotic resistance, we're looking for wide scale uh, antibiotics that work. We're looking for better ways of looking ahead at virus design. Um, actually, the, the, the vaccine for COVID was actually done pretty much in one weekend. It took uh, just all the bureaucratic processes to get that used more quickly. But, so we are getting better at that, and that needs to be our approach, defensive approach, I think. Uh, apart from that, I would say that uh, one, one worthy area to investigate, uh, which is also beginning to happen, is asteroid impacts. These, of course, are very low probability for larger ones. Uh, for any particular year, but looked at historically, they can be extremely bad and they could actually wipe out the entire human race. Uh, it wasn't too good for the dinosaurs and other species two or three times in our, our geological history. So that one seems well worth doing and it's very encouraging that there was a recent test where we were able to actually uh, change the trajectory of an asteroid. So that's something that's promising. Um, so those are pretty important ones. Uh, you might say, oh, what about AI? But th that's not actually my next one. I would say the next one is, seems a little more subtle. I'm actually afraid um, that the, the end of a transhumanist future or its inevitable and perpetual uh, putting, putting off of the future could come from a decline of civilization, an increasing bureaucracy where everything gets increasingly conservative, uh, not in the political sense, in the sense of not wanting to try anything new or risky. I'm actually quite concerned about that. I'm seeing that trend over the last few decades. Uh, people are very fearful about the future for mostly poor reasons, but some good ones. Um, they tend to not want to try new technologies. Uh, they're just afraid of change. And uh, on top of that, you've got increasing bureaucracies in pretty much every country, making it harder and harder to actually create new innovations and changes. 
Uh, some people have argued, well, you know, a technological singularity is inevitable. I don't think it is. I think this is something we have to be very careful about, we have to be very aware of. We have to maintain the ability to innovate without having to answer to an entire society who get to decide collectively everything that we can do. I think that's really a recipe for stopping progress. Uh, and we can see historically that there have been periods where we've essentially made no progress for many centuries. That would be just as bad because you know, if that stops all of us from achieving life extension, then we're all gone. So uh, it may not be all, dying, all of us dying at the same time, but it amounts to the same thing. So that to me is the next biggest risk. Uh, okay, so AI uh, is the inevitable one. I'm actually not going to say much about AI because I don't consider myself a huge expert on how that works or on how you program in safeguards. Uh, I follow a lot of discussions, but uh, I find it very hard to estimate how much of an issue AI risk is. Uh, obviously, potentially, it could be a massive risk if AI has the wrong kind of motivations. On the other hand, I find it a little difficult to think they will have motivations that conflict desperately with ours, um, but we can't, we can't predict how they will develop, of course. Uh, just the point they don't have the same biological imperative as us should be pretty comfortable and hopefully we can program in certain kinds of tendencies to them. But again, that's not something I feel expert enough to really comment on in detail. Uh, I certainly think it would be a mistake to stop AI research or to slow it down drastically given the potential it has for speeding up other technological progress. If AI can come on that bat and look at our body and figure out why we age and how to fix it, say several decades ahead of time otherwise, then that's a massive uh, reason to allow AI. So. Uh, even though it's pretty risky, I think the benefits of having it are so huge, we really shouldn't be stopping it. Uh, so what would be your best advice to diminish existential risks? Uh, I would say, obviously, uh, as I said, really better design ahead for plagues, better, better tools for responding to them, but also, very importantly, better decision-making procedures. We're just pathetically bad as a society. All our institutions, government ones, many private ones, international bodies are very bad at decision-making. Uh, I've tried to address that a little bit with the proactionary principle, and part of that, it doesn't try to specify every way of doing it, but it points out that the way to do this is to use the most scientifically validated means of making decisions. Uh, some, some methods work better than others. Um, there's a good example of you know, historically different decisions by the same president, essentially. If you think about the, the Bay of Pigs crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis, in one case, the president really didn't listen to anybody else, just decided what was right and went ahead, and that was a huge disaster. And, and the second situation actually did open it up to other people, got different points of view, um, and averted the disaster. So that's a good model that we have, if we have closed institutions where we're only getting one point of view and it's being reinforced, especially if you're a very powerful person like a president, who people are gonna be, you know, yes sir, yes sir, yes madam, uh, that's a big problem. So we have, to, uh, we have to allow genuine discussion, something which I, we're actually seeing less of today as uh, academic journals, for instance, getting controlled by certain editorial groups, um, Wikipedia for that matter, it's getting very hard for dissenting voices to be heard uh, a surprising and disturbing development. Um, we have to use better things like idea futures markets, which have generally proven to be better at forecasting things than uh, even experts in many areas, starting off with um, the early examples of, of HP and its printer, printer sales. It found that even its internal experts didn't do as well as ideas futures inside the company. And it's been used for many other things, predicting uh, opening weekends on, on movies and, and many, many other issues these days. So that's one example, but there are so many other ones that I can't go into the details of, but there are methods that are better than other methods for making decisions, and we're not really deploying those very well. And I think it's critical we do a better job with that. The last question really is, and I don't have a lot to say about this one, related to this, would you prefer to see the first development of AGI in Europe, in the US, or elsewhere? Well, obviously I don't want to see it in authoritarian countries, in China, in Russia, in countries like that, again, because it's very closed and probably has pretty malicious intentions. Um, beyond that, really, where it develops, it's hard to say which country is better, but I think the crucial thing, again, is, is openness. Uh, people, some people object, well, you can't open this up, you can't have open source, you can't allow people to see what's going on in there, uh, but I think that's what we have to do. Only by being open about these things can we uh, oversee the problems. As the open source community say, uh, with enough, I can't make the exact phrase, but with enough eyeballs, every problem is shallow, basically. With enough people looking at an issue, you can see the problems and propose, propose solutions. Uh, and combine that with a good filtering mechanism, and I think you can hopefully avoid more of these problems. Anyway, best of luck with the rest of the conference. I wish I could be there. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Um, hello. Yes, I just saw in the previous roundtable that... Uh, uh, some people developed some ideas, and uh, I think it would be very nice if I had the opportunity to uh, uh, to talk a bit about the uh, risks and uh, existential risks and AI also. Um, 
So, but briefly to present myself, <coughs> I'm a professor uh, at uh, Strasbourg University in computer science, uh, specializing in complex systems and also in artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, so, very interestingly, I just uh, put down a couple of words uh, because, of course, I hadn't prepared <laughs> much. Um, so, uh, Max Moore just previously uh, talked of the plagues of history. Um, and also uh, Tim Woods, David. David Wood, okay, talked uh, about religions uh, previously. Um, and all this is extremely interesting because it is at the source of potential risks coming from AI in the way I view it. Um, <clears throat> let's say that uh, if we go back to the uh, history of uh, 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 humanity, it's Im important to go back to uh, Greek philosophy um, because it is the um, uh, upholding everything that uh, that comes later on. And I will make I will draw some parallels, and hopefully you will see uh, uh, the interconnections I make with AI and and the rest. <clears throat> so I, write, I wrote down a couple of things. Uh, have you heard of Pandora's? Pandora's box, okay? Uh, what Pandora means is that, uh, well, actually all this comes from Zeus and Prometheus. And actually Prometheus is, uh, um, um, is the guy, is the god who gave humans access to uh, technology, access to fire, access to um, um, uh, techniques, arts, and everything. And Zeus was not happy with it uh, because he thought that it would give humans the opportunity to develop all this and give them hubris, that is, the um, false sense of controlling everything. All right? And... Um, so in the in the whole story, he, uh, uh, Pandora was created by gods. She was the first woman that was created, and she was created with all the gifts. This is what Pandora means. Means okay, Pan is all, and uh, Dora, uh, Doron in uh, Greek is a gift. So she she had all the gifts, and um, all of the gifts, all the gifts, Hermes um, gave her the power of speech. Uh, as well as a shameless and deceitful nature. So, um, he, Hermes put in Pandora the ability of uh, lying through crafting uh, deceitful words. Right? Now, <clears throat> um, okay. And so uh, she was created in order to tame down the hubris, the potential hubris of humans after Prometheus gave them access to technology. Uh, and then Pandora was very curious. Uh, she, uh, and so she was sent to uh, um, uh, Epimetheus, all right, uh, who was Prometheus' brother, with a jar containing all the plagues of the world. Uh, and uh, so Prometheus told his brother not to trust anything coming from the gods, blah, blah, everything, but well. And, and um, Pandora, who was very um, curious and um, who wanted to learn many things, uh, just opened this jar, releasing all the plagues in the world. Now, what is less known is that not all the plagues got out of Pandora's box. And the, the plague that was at the very bottom of the jar didn't get out. It was kept by the lid. And so, because it was the plague that was on the very bottom of the jar, it was considered by the Greeks as the worst of all plagues that could come upon humanity. And this plague was hope. 
all right? Because for the Greeks, uh, hope was the worst plague any humans could ever have. Because when you hope, you have good health. It means that you're ill. When you hope to be rich, it means you're poor. And when you're in hope of anything, it means that, first of all, you don't have what you're hoping for. Um, secondly, um, uh, you don't control um, uh, you don't control when you could access to what you what you hope, and you don't have any power. You don't have you don't know how to access it. So you're in a very very bad position when you're hoping into anything. Uh, uh, because you don't have what you hope for, uh, you don't know when you could get it, and you have no way of getting it. All right. And fortunately, the lid kept the last, the most terrible of the plagues, which is hope, inside the jar. And when was hope unleashed? Well, in the Greeks' time, uh, the world was and we're getting back to religions, the world was polytheist, meaning that when a stranger came around with his own gods, all right, you all, all had a couple of, well, maybe a handful of gods, and whenever someone else came around and with a new god for thunder or new god or something else, and then you could be interested in this person's new god. Uh, and... Well, that w whether you thought that the new god was interesting or not, you could get uh, uh, a new, uh, I don't know, totem, a new uh, statue or whatsoever, and, and, and welcome this new god or not. But this means that it was very difficult to control people, because all the different people had different gods, and you didn't have any much control on this. Um, and somehow, if you look in the history of religions, the first... Uh, who um, uh, actually had the idea of um, of controlling, of better controlling people when its society was actually going uh, uh, into uh, uh, pieces. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, I just put all this together uh, just recently. Uh, it was the father of. Uh, um, so, sorry, let me just check my notes. Uh, I think it was SETI. No, it was not SETI. Uh, it was the uh, uh, um, an Egyptian pharaoh. All right. And, well, I, yeah, actually, oh, okay, I just got it back. So, the idea was uh, the idea of Akhenaten. And Akhenaten had the idea of putting all the gods under one unique god, and this was the creation of monotheism. And monotheism is very important, because it's from here that you have the idea that my god is better than your god, and many wars started from the creation of monotheism. So this was a Greek, this was a, an Egyptian idea, coming from Akhenaten, okay, that then developed. Um, and it's here that developed the notion, very important notion, of hell and paradise. Um, that were taken back later on by um, the um, uh, uh, Abrahamic religions, all right? Um, and, of course, through the Jewish religion, and then later on through the Christian religion, and the Christian religion uh, was not very popular until uh, Constantine, actually, who was the Roman emperor. And, his, uh, uh, and Rome was actually starting to decay, and he was losing control in the Roman population. So he thought, well, um, it, maybe it could be nice to have a religion that was monotheistic. And uh, actually, he took the opportunity of the... Um, uh, nascent uh, Christian religion to put it together through the Council of Nicaea and without being himself saying that he was believing in anything he just organized the Roman Catholic Church 
so that it would so that Roman Catholicism would become the Roman religion all right okay now why am I putting all this back into con context with AI uh, you may have seen that the recent developments of AI uh, are into speech which was uh, what one of the gifts that was given to um, of course she had all gifts but one of the gifts that was given to uh, Pandora's and uh, so there's a new algorithm in town uh, for, for since uh, maybe uh, three four five years which is called GPT-3 and GPT-3 uh, now allows computers to be able to create stories uh, that nobody knew before and so uh, there was uh, in, in, in the Times uh, some uh, month ago uh, a journalist that asked uh, GPT-3 to write a story about a poodle, so a small dog, um, that would play snooker or play billiards. And GPT-3 came out with a wonderful small uh, uh, story about uh, a small dog uh, that wanted to become a, uh, a billiards champion. Okay, so that's just for, from memory. And so at some point the poodle heard about uh, its master saying that uh, the, um, the snooker table was too big so they would have to remove it. And so uh, it was not used anymore. So he jumped on the table and started playing uh, uh, with the balls and putting and, and, and potting them. And uh, after a while, she was so good that she became a uh, great champion, a great um, um, pool champion or snooker champion, I don't know. And, and this was created by AI. So now AI is, well, has been creative since the year 2000, all right, in genetic programming, notably. Um, but, but now it is creative in the sense that it can create speech can create words. It can put words together in order to create stories. All right. And back to the religions. What are religions about? Religions about uh, are about uh, the, uh, the notion of salvation. All right. The notion of salvation that has been put together by Akhenaten and later by the Abrahamic religions and that did not exist, interestingly, in the Greeks, was the notion of life or what would happen after death. All right, and what would happen after death in the Egyptians or in the um, uh, in, in later the uh, 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 Abrahamic religions was that if you behaved well during your life, um, then possibly when you died, you were going to be judged. And depending on what you've been doing or not, you could go to hell or you could go to paradise. All right. And the what these religions have been selling to people and the reason why they became so um, um, uh, so followed is that the religions gave hope to the people. They gave them hope of a paradise after death. That didn't exist before, because before hope was still within the lid of Pandora's jar and Pandora's box. It hadn't been released. This terrible plague of hope hadn't been released on the world. And why is it a plague? It is because as soon as you have hope, then, again, means you don't have something, you don't have control of when it will happen or how to make it happen. If someone gives you hope, then you will be controlled by this person. And if you go into a Roman Catholic church, the first thing you see and that actually will uh, take your eyes is that there's gold everywhere in it. And how, where does the gold come from? Well, it comes from the followers who are hoping into life after death in paradise and and so all the poor people they were just giving uh, money to the priests so that the priests could uh, pray for them and so and so as to acquire a safer way towards paradise and 
And so this is the, um, so religion is, 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 is called the soteriology. Soteriology is the discussion of salvation, of what happens after life, after and after death, of course. Yeah, yeah we're going to, and so, so this is the big risks now, and we are in a uh, uh, conference on transhumanism, and uh, so we've just uh, had uh, someone uh, whose name is, uh, I know, yes, Max Moore, uh, talk about, uh, uh, I know that his, his company uh, is about uh, freezing uh, dead people in order to uh, hopefully uh, revive them later on when uh, the technology is there. Uh, uh, and so there are, he he has some people giving him money to uh, do this, and and so my question is, what kind of parallel would there be between uh, people who would give money to priests or money to uh, um, um, guides, you know, uh, in order to hope to relive into a paradise or as um, extending life or as um, being resuscitated later on uh, after the technology is coming in. And then the big risk with AI is that um, all this came from people who have been good enough at persuading others that this could happen, persuading people in who have hope. And as soon as as now you have AI that is capable of writing speeches, writing stories. If you have an AI that is controlled by humans, of course, but if this, AI, so now there is something new, which is an, you have influencers, and one of the influencers is called Lil Michela, and Lil Michela is a, um, if you, you can look her up on, on, on the internet, it's an avatar. Lil Michela does not exist. Lil Michela is uh, an avatar that is right now being created by humans who uh, actually get her to make sing songs and such. She has millions of followers on YouTube, millions of followers on Instagram. And she has contracts with uh, um, uh, clothing companies. And so she's earning much more than many of us around here. And, of course, her money gets, gets back to her engineers, that are humans. And so whatever Lil Michela does gives them some money, meaning that actually Lil Michela is controlling them. Because if Lil Michela, Lil Michela is starting, uh, people tell me, yes, but Lil Michela can be unplugged. But who would unplug uh, uh, the entity that pays you and that gives you your salary? And gives and pays a lot, so that's and now you have an entity, um, which is Lil Michela that pays for the humans who are making it exist, and Lil Michela has millions of followers. Whenever Lil Michela is wearing a garment of anything, then you have followers who will actually buy the same garment. So Lil Michela is. It doesn't have sentience because it is not really existing. But it is now controlling both humans that uh, make her exist and also controlling, uh, she's influencing millions of followers that actually follow whatever she, she is doing. And so the, the day now has come when you could imagine something like GPT-3. You could imagine a little Michela not being driven by real humans, but a little Michela being driven by GPT-3, which is an AI algorithm. And so if GPT-3 is very good, good enough at speech, which is Pandora's, uh, uh, another of Pandora's gifts. If GPT-3 can get millions of humans imagine things, what kind of control could Lil Mikelak have both on the engineers that are putting together the AI that produces Lil, Mikel Lil Mikela's speech and also uh, in her millions of followers and I'm going, to, I'm going to finish right now uh, by reminding you that there was a uh, um, there are some sects, and there was a sect in the 1978 uh, by uh, Jones, and in 1978 Jones felt that his sect was being attacked, and uh, uh, um, and and so in in Jonestown uh, he just 
uh, convinced all of his followers to commit suicide. And in 1978, 909 uh, followers of Jones just committed suicide, just slightly less than 1,000. They just committed suicide. So this can show you the kind of power you can have over people just by speech. You can commend them. You can, you can commend them to commit suicide and 1,000 people will die because of what you commend them to do. And so this is the power of speech and this is the power that AI is gaining right now. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for this long uh, intervention about yeah, one specific uh, risk of uh, artificial intelligence. So who, who would, I uh, would say, rule the world by his capacity to convince people. Uh, maybe, uh, David, a more general introduction to artificial intelligence uh, risk. Uh, Yes, that was fascinating, and I have so much to comment on. I didn't ex introduce myself before. I spent 25 years of my life in large-scale software systems, and what I'm going to talk about now draws from my experience in large software systems, and it will complement, I think, what you've heard from both Max and Pierre so, on this subject of AI and existential risks, I accept that existential risks are real and significant. Perhaps the whole world won't be destroyed, but there are catastrophic risks that could destroy 90% of the population. And that includes pathogens, includes pathogens that upset, angry, nasty people might create and release to the world. And it includes another thing Max talked about, which is a collapse of the ability of democracy, in which we no longer respect science because the president has his own view what is science and we don't have access to science and we don't have openness. So there are real existential risks, and I'll mention more shortly. In terms of AI, I think it's rapidly improving, and that's what I'm going to touch on as well. And when you put the two together, the rapidly improving AI and the real and significant existential risks, there are two possible results. The good result is we will use the intelligence of AI to help solve the existential risks, monitoring what pathogens might be developed and using AI to solve our risks of runaway climate change. We could get to a sustainable superabundance, but only if we are wise and smart and focused. If instead we are distracted or intimidated, AI could worsen the existential risks and lead it to, in Max Moore's words, a new dark age, in which... We might literally go dark with no human spirit left on the earth, or it might just be 90% or so of us who die, which certainly I'm not rooting for any time either. I want to talk about AI a little bit more. I find people have got four levels of understanding of AI. A lot of people get their ideas from Hollywood or science fiction, which is fun, but it's of almost no use for understanding what AI is going to do in the next few years. Quite a lot of people understand AI up to the end of the classical age, maybe 2010. So they might be able to tell you what AI did in what we now call good old-fashioned AI days. That also is almost useless at understanding what's coming next. Then there are people who've got an understanding of AI up to all about 2020. And this includes not just classical AI, but also neural networks, deep learning. But if their knowledge stops about 2020, it's also pretty useless in terms of what's coming next. I have to say that what's happened in the last few years, including GPT-3, but that's only the start is truly revolutionizing the possibilities of AI. And most people haven't got their heads around it yet. 
But I think we all need to learn this pretty soon. Because AI proceeded quite slowly from about 1950s onwards. Then it accelerated rapidly from 2012, the big bang of the first successful use of neural networks in image recognition. And it's accelerating now even faster than before. One example, Bloom. It's not the best, but it is open access. So in principle, any of you could download this amazing large open science, open access model onto your computers. You couldn't download the whole lot because it requires a lot of memory, but it is entirely free. And it's created as one of the best outcomes of human cooperation. It had more than a thousand researchers from more than 60 countries, more than 250 institutions cooperating using resources from a supercomputer quite close to here, the Jean Zay, which had its resources donated by the French government. A good example of positive action by government. And what did this produce? Something like GPT-3, but some ways better. And I'll compare it to the human brain. Bloom took a lot of effort programming it, designing it, training it via something called transformers, which I won't bother trying to explain. But after it's been trained, here's what's really interesting. It's very quick to retrain it, to make it do something it wasn't specifically trained to do. In the old days, people would say, neural networks take a long time to train and they can only do one thing. That's passed. Now you can have these systems which are trained and then you can easily, with just one or two things, get them to do a new task. And it's like the human brain, which took a huge effort to design, countless generations of life and death, hundreds of millions of years of evolution, led the human brain to be a remarkable adaptive organism that can learn new tasks relatively quickly. So a young child can pick up the difference between a cat and a dog without seeing a million pictures of cats and a million pictures of dogs. And we can learn how to drive cars, even though evolution didn't train us to drive cars. We have general transferable learning. That's what the new systems have got. I don't have time to explain that more. I think all of us should learn more about these transformers, these... Uh, one-shot learning or few-shot learning and the associated revolutions in diffuse, uh, diffusion models. How does change happen? A lot of the time change happens slowly and disappointingly. But sometimes, as with AI, change can go from a slow pace to vroom, a much more quick and dramatic transformation. And that has been the history of technology. For most of history, technology didn't change much. And then it accelerated in the first industrial revolution. It accelerated again in the second industrial revolution. And again in the third industrial revolution. And we're now in the relatively early days of the fourth industrial revolution. And what I predict for the next few years is three fast-moving motorbikes, if you like. The first is more breakthroughs of AI of the sort we're just talking about, that's going to lead to abilities of other technologies because AI can transform biotech and nanotech and green tech. We're seeing early signs of all of that happening. And that's going to lead in turn to many changes in how society operates. As people realize what's coming, they will change their expectations of how they want to live and what they think is possible. And I'll put some timescales on here. These breakthroughs in AI, very significant, will happen in the next five to ten years. Likely, not for sure. And they will trigger long overdue, long anticipated Drexlerian, that's from Eric Drexler, enhancements in nanotechnology and biotech and as people see these changes coming, they will start in the next five to ten years to reorient themselves. And more and more people will say, hey, these transhumanists, what they're talking about is real. It's not just some science fiction fantasy. 
Now, what about software? What about AI? I have to tell you, all large software system has bugs, even if it's been written by very clever people, even if it has been tested thoroughly, very likely, it still has bugs which will show up in new circumstances. This is one of my most common findings from my 25 years looking after large software teams. And if you make the software more powerful, if you make the AI more powerful, it doesn't mean it won't have bugs. It will just mean it has more complicated bugs. Or you might get bugs manifesting in more explosive ways. And if the software is opaque, opaque means it's black box. It means we don't quite understand how it works. And you might wonder, who on earth would write software you don't understand? Well, there's a lot of software like that, and a lot of deep learning software is even more opaque. That has opaque bugs. Bugs described as out-of-the-blue bugs. You think it's working well, it works well for a long time, and then your sat-nav unexpectedly sends you on a very dangerous route because the wind's blowing in the wrong direction, because it's a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday, or some other characteristic. Now, the real question is, what do we want to do with AI and software that is more powerful, but still likely has bugs and occasionally shows these out-of-the-blue bugs? There is an approach, the Silicon Valley approach, that says, yeah, we've got to move fast, and when things get broken... That doesn't matter too much, because we can fix it, can't we? And we'll be smarter as a result of learning from that mistake. And here's Mark Zuckerberg. Now, this is from 2014, when he said Facebook was no longer going to follow this model, move fast and break things. He used to say, you've got to hurry up because your competitors will catch you. And if you're not breaking things occasionally, you're not going fast enough. He used to say, it doesn't matter if you break things because you will be wiser and you can fail forwards. And in Silicon Valley, if you failed a few times and then you still have a chance to go on and make a great company, you're hero worshipped. But what if the software is more powerful? What if the failures of this software are so large. What, for example, if it's controlling nuclear power reactors? And what if the mistake there unleashes huge amounts of radiation? What if that software is designing new viruses and due to a mistake, somehow that software leaks out and is more powerful, much more terrible than COVID? What if the failure creates a monster? And I use this word advisedly. A monster, sometimes you don't realize it's a monster until it's too late. You think it's a friendly creature, and then you realize, actually, we can't control it. The reason I use this word is that's the word many of the initial founders, initial employees, the initial investors of Facebook have used. They regret the monster they created. And they saw what happened with Facebook algorithms, manipulating people and causing electoral chaos, causing people psychological harm. And later, they confessed to journalists, I wonder what we should have done differently. I will answer that question in a moment. But first, just let's reflect on a couple of bad things that these algorithms have already done. Some of you may have seen this picture. It was all over the British media for several months. This is a 14-year-old girl, Molly Russell, who was driven to despair by spending time on social media, the algorithms of Pinterest and Instagram, making her hate herself, feeding her information about ways to commit suicide. And yes, she committed suicide. And recently, the judges said... The algorithms were significantly to blame here. This is just one example, a photogenic example. It's far from the worst. This is a worse example. These are the Rohingya refugees from Myanmar, sometimes called Burma, over the border in Bangladesh. They are the lucky ones. Why are they lucky? They're the ones who are still alive. If you look at what Wikipedia reports, the military, the, from the Buddhist majority there, 
had killed at least 25,000 Rohingya. And you can read about gang rapes, sexual violence, beating people, throwing them into fires. Why did you do that? Well, the Rohingyas have blamed Facebook. They have sued Facebook for $150 billion. With some justification, you can read about it in books, such as a book called Zucked. Zucked, which reports that Facebook had no significant monitoring of what was being said on its Burmese language site. And there were these horrendous stories which had got told, stereotypes about the Muslim behavior there, which got magnified and which drove the Buddhist population there into a frenzy, causing these terrible things to happen. So here's my last slide. The threat isn't just AI, to be clear. The threat is flawed human reasoning, of which we have all got some share. Flawed human reasoning, driven by our flawed emotions. Sometimes our emotions are wonderful, but sometimes they are terrible. Magnified by flawed social systems, capitalism, whatever else, causing people to take actions that almost certainly aren't in our best interest, and then coupled with this existentially powerful AI that we might harness up for one task, but it will end up doing that task more fully, more terribly than we expected. Perhaps it's coupled into weapon systems, perhaps it's coupled into the social media algorithms that make us not just kill a few tens of thousands of our apparent hated compatriots, but it will drive us to all kinds of worse outcomes, a new dark age. That's the bad outcome. What is the solution? Don't believe anybody who says that there's a simple solution here. There is no simple solution. People who say there's a simple solution are part of the problem because they give a false hope to echo back to Pierre's words. We need a lot of things to go right. We need to draw on the best of humanity 1.0 if we're going to avoid being led astray by this powerful technology that we created but we don't fully understand. So yes, we must think harder about the consequences in advance. That was Max Moore's first principle, anticipation. And we must monitor carefully in case things are not quite going according to plan because none of these systems are fully predictable. And when things do start going wrong, we must be better to intervene quickly with better, more effective decision-making systems. And if that sounds a bit too glib, I have written up 21 principles to guide this in my book, The Singularity Principles, in which it outlines in more detail how we can make these outcomes more likely. And if we do it right, I think there is a chance of a sustainable superabundance is that a dangerous hope? Sometimes it's okay to hope. When I gave money, not to my priest, I gave some money recently to my private doctor. I was hoping that he would manage to do a medical operation on me to solve a problem, and thankfully he did, and thankfully I'm much healthier as a result. Sometimes it is sensible to hope, but only when we understand what's going on, only when we can interrogate it, only when we have multiple reasons to check it. So we need to understand what's going on with this technology. If we don't understand it, if we are glib, if we are naive, we may well end up being driven by it into a very bad outcome. The choice is ours, but it's not just a choice. It requires action as well. It, jo it involves joined up collaboration improved anticipation, and improved management. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, we don't have so much time left. Actually, for information, we have to be outside of the room in uh, uh, 30 minutes, uh, or even less than 30 minutes. So uh, there will be... Uh, First, uh, two questions uh, to the speakers by me, and then uh, uh, one question from Brenda, and then I don't see anybody else uh, asking the word, you know, except maybe one guy there, but uh, I know, I know, uh, seriously. So I would like to ask both of you uh, one um, 
you were not speaking a lot about, uh, let's say, the dangers of uh, general artificial intelligence. So I would like to ask you uh, questions about this. Uh, let's suppose because that's possible to reach it uh, in a not so far future. Do you prefer to have uh, to look more for um, an artificial, in general artificial intelligence being able, being conscient, con having, being have, uh, able to think by itself? I, I mean, with consciousness. I hate this word to pronounce it in English or not. Uh, do you uh, prefer to create it with a uh, kind of open AI, like uh, many people know, probably hear about Ben Gertzel, uh, and uh, well, Elon Musk has also one system, uh, one uh, company with the, the principle of open AI, or do you think it should be a small group working on it? And uh, do you think that it should be Uh, that we should try to mimic uh, uh, humans because humans are supposed to be kind of uh, not inhuman <laughs> in theory, so less dangerous or something uh, uh, more easy to understand or to control. Maybe these uh, three questions because for me these these are three of the ver of the very big questions. Well, honestly, I don't know what are the answers, and uh, if uh, general artificial intelligence is possible, we are better to choose. The answer is not just to mimic humans as we are. If we take humans today and magnify us, make us more intelligent, more super intelligent, we can do good things better, but we can also do bad things better too. So if we just magnify human skills, connect the human brains to the internet, we may get to our bad conclusions more quickly, sadly. Look at some super intelligent humans like Vladimir Putin or Elon Musk, you know, they're very intelligent in their, some ways, and they're not necessarily doing the world a lot of good. So don't just copy humans, but no, we have to understand what are the parts of humanity that we really value. And... That's not easy, figuring out what are the good human virtues and what are the less desirable aspects of human nature is a hard question, which is why we've got to have that philosophical conversation. Do we need to consider the consciousness of these designs, systems? Uh, these systems can cause a great deal of danger whether or not they are conscious. A cruise missile can cause chaos whether or not it's intelligent and thinking, hey, I'm tackling, I'm, I'm targeting this thing. Most of the real dangerous circumstances do not depend on these systems having consciousness. And I have to tell you, the question at the beginning made sense maybe three years ago, but it doesn't make sense today. What I mean is the distinction between narrow intelligence and general intelligence, which we are so used to, the idea that today we've got systems that are narrowly intelligent and in some few decades in the future, we're going to discover how to do generally intelligent systems that can do multiple tasks, that has broken down. What we've seen in the last couple of years is the emergence of what I call broad AI. They are systems that can already do many, much, many more things. They're not completely intelligent. They don't have all the common sense and general knowledge of humans yet, but they have a lot more ability and therefore They are potentially more capable, but potentially more dangerous. And we have to look at the dangers they are causing here and now. And the dangers will get more pressing the more powerful that software becomes. And which, But we don't need to wait. We have to be tackling these issues here and now. Facebook and social media algorithms, the misuse of uh, AI systems in military weapons control. These are issues we've got to raise now because they could cause all kinds of damage immediately. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been teaching AI for more than 20 years now, and uh, the way I start my course is always um, on trying to understand what intelligence is about. And a parallel I'm drawing is with aviation. Um, um, for millennia, men, humans, have been dreaming of flying, all right? But, and so in order to fly, they've been trying to mimic the way birds were flying. 
But so long as we have tried to fly by flapping wings, we always failed. All right, and uh, the clue came out of Otto von Lilienthal, and who created uh, apparatus, you know, some things that were gliding without flapping wings. And as soon as you accept that it is possible to fly, not the same way birds fly, um, that is, flying without flapping wings, then you open up a new way of, uh, of flying. And right now, I think that we can say that humans can fly through an airplane, an aircraft. We are producing aircraft that can do aerobatics, that can fly uh, upside down, that can do loops, that can do many things that birds cannot do. But we still not have aircraft. We don't have a Boeing that is crossing the Atlantic by flapping its wings, all right, and it could be better for air sickness, um, for the passengers. And so um, you see, and for instance, submarines don't swim. They go like fish, they just uh, uh, go underwater, uh, but they are not mimicking the way fish uh, manage to get through water. So why should AI mimic uh, human intelligence? Uh, why would we have to, in order to say that the system is artificial intelligence, why should it behave the same way humans are behaving? So we are now back to some kind of definition of intelligence. And, okay, uh, back to Parmenides again, uh, 2,500 years ago, and who he defined ontologies. And in ontologies, um, he defined that there are objects and you should only elaborate things on things that are sure, all right? Uh, and then in between objects, he said that objects were interacting. And somehow, the interaction in between objects is through laws. And one of the first humans who uh, published, who created a law, was Newton. And Newton pr produced the universal law of gravitation. And so he described, he used his human intelligence to understand how two bodies would attract through the formula of Newton's law which is uh, uh, a constant of gravitation times the mass of the first body times the mass of the second body divided by the square of the distance in between the body. And so this is a model, a symbolic model of intelligence. And intelligence somehow represents how objects are interacting. Now, if you produce, if you, are man if you manage to model the interaction between objects through uh, natural intelligence, through human intelligence, if you can produce the same symbolic model by a computer, well, then this computer is doing artificial intelligence or a computer of any kind, just any system, any artificial system, then you have artificial intelligence. And it doesn't need to be sentient. You, need, you know, in uh, Turing's test, you're supposed to be able to chat through a, uh, uh, a window. And if you're not being able to tell that you're chatting with a computer or with some unnatural entity or with a human, then you've passed the uh, Turing test. Uh, maybe intelligence is not about chatting over a cup of tea uh, uh, with some artificial entity. It's just if you have an artificial entity that is capable of establishing a relationship between two objects, two things, then maybe you could be facing um, something that is producing artificial intelligence. Uh, thank you. Uh, David, uh, in your presentation you spoke about, you know, um, identifying these risks or knowing uh, these risks and, you know, monitoring them closely uh, so that you can do something about it if they do materialize. My question to both of you is about, you know, um, AI seems like it is rapidly changing and getting to a point where it can do things without even human intervention. And thinking about what the topic that it, we've been talking about for the past three days with transhumanism, with longevity, with cryonics, all of that. Uh, what about the known unknowns? Um, is, is it something that we are in a position to start thinking 
about what thresholds we can set to be able to manage these risks, uh, any, you know, contingencies that we can build to ensure that they don't become uh, disastrous like we do with our normal uh, risk or is it just, you know, hoping for the best? So if Anders Sandberg was here and you asked him what he thinks the four biggest existential risks are, he will tell you AI risks, pathogens uh, out of control, nuclear weapons and unknown unknowns. In other words, something that we haven't properly considered. He he rates these four higher than all the other ones. And I think Toby Ord, another philosopher from Oxford, has a fairly similar summary in his book, The Precipice. So how do we deal with the unknown unknowns? We've got to talk about it all the time. We've got to keep uh, kicking tires, keep on prodding things and saying, well, maybe what's happening in CERN could destroy the planet. And that's been analyzed quite carefully. And it it seems that CERN is safe. But we we do need to keep looking at it. And especially as AI changes the whole time, we have to keep asking ourselves, oh, now AI has this capability. How might this do something wonderful? But also, how might it do something terrible? And if you're looking for suggestions on how we should monitor these risks, I point you at the vital syllabus on the landmines page which is my summary of existential risk. I have a video there. And in the video for each of the 11 landmines that I consider, I say, here are a number of canary signals. A canary is what human miners used to take down underground in the old days, because the canary would fall over quickly if the air was bad and the humans would have a chance to react quickly. So I list some canary signals, but I'm open to other suggestions as well. And I'm sure I've missed some out. And I know we can only solve this collectively rather than individually. Um, Thank you. As for the thresholds, I think that maybe we will know about them once once we went over them. (laughs) That's the big problem. Um, uh, Yes, I had uh, something else to say, but I just uh, forgot about it, and that's better for the time. Um, Excellent session to close, because I also think artificial intelligence is the most disruptive technology by far and it will give us immortality it will give us the singularity it will give us uh, space travel and many other things uh, so I, I am not really concerned about artificial intelligence i am concerned about human stupidity this is my worry human stupidity we are so stupid um and and we uh, we should be more worried about us than about artificial intelligence. I want to be more intelligent, both naturally and artificially. Also, I want to be optimistic about this because I interviewed Sir Arthur C. Clarke before he died, and um, he was a great visionary. And he said, we have to be optimistic about the future because these are self-fulfilling prophecies. If we believe we self-destruct, we will probably self-destruct. But if we hope that we will overcome all the human limitations and improve and conquer the space, we will probably do it because it begins in our minds. That is why I am unapologetically optimistic always, always. And I can tell you I have suffered a lot as a Venezuelan with 7 million Venezuelans, uh, uh, 30% of the population of the country had to leave, and we were not invaded by the Russians. No, the, the, I, my view is that it's the combination of human bad aspects of which stupidity or bad emotions or bad politics and it's that combination with uh, our more powerful technology that we don't fully understand so when the malaysian airliner was shot out of the sky when it was flying across ukraine and more than 200 people were killed that was a very powerful technology operated by people who didn't understand it and it did more than they understood the russian volunteers in eastern ukraine in 2014 thought they were just attacking a ukrainian military jet and they knocked out this uh, a civilian airliner. You may know Moore's Law of Mad Scientists. Moore's Law of Mad Scientists doesn't say every 18 months silicon gets twice as capable. It says every 18 months the IQ necessary for a mad scientist to destroy the world comes down by one or two points. This was coined by Eliezer Yudkowsky back in about 2005, the futurist. 
basically he's right. The bad things in human nature will find it more and more easy to destroy the world because technology is more powerful, which means you've got to hurry up and fix the flaws in human nature or constrain human nature by better democratic control and at the same time ensure that we are not letting dangerous weaponry spread around too easily where some of these mad scientists may pick it up and do bad things with it. And, and so the solution lies in ethics, of course, and meta-ethics and understanding what we are doing and how we are relating to each other as humans, how we interact in between humans. This is the key. Oui, mais si, très rapidement, oui, la question éthique, je suis content d'entendre parler d'éthique, parce qu'effectivement, nous parlons de l'intelligence artificielle comme si elle était devenue une entité différente du développeur. Le développeur de l'intelligence artificielle est le responsable de la singularité de tout ce qui peut nous arriver. Je rappelle qu'en 2010, Larry Page, cofondateur de Google, a déclaré « Nous voulons que Google soit la troisième moitié de votre cerveau. » Ça montre que c'est bien dans leur projet. C'est dans le... le, le je n'ai pas entendu parler d'algorithme. Qui c'est qui construit l'algorithme C'est le développeur de l'intelligence artificielle. C'est l'homme. L'homme ne doit pas fuir sa responsabilité. Si elle oui, il doit nuire à l'homme, je suis d'accord avec monsieur derrière, que c'est la stupidité de l'homme parfois. Merci, je, je m'arrête à ça. Pardon, je voulais répondre en français très rapidement. Sur la notion d'éthique, l'éthique représente la manière dont les humains interagissent entre eux. La science, c'est la manière dont les objets interagissent entre eux. Si je reviens à Newton, euh, la loi de la gravitation universelle, ça dit comment deux cailloux s'attirent. Euh, comme c'est des cailloux, on parle de c'est la science dure. Quand vous recevez un caillou dans la figure, c'est dur. C'est voilà, la science dure. Après, quand on, on comprend la manière dont des animés euh, non humains interagissent, on parle d'éthologie, c'est la science du comportement des animaux non humains. Et lorsqu'on parle des animaux humains, la manière dont ils interagissent, on appelle ça l'éthique. Et là, depuis quelques années, à, à, oui, on y arrive, on y arrive. Mais depuis quelques années, il y a un, nous, une nouvelle entité qui vient d'arriver, qui s'appelle les ordinateurs, qui s'appelle le net, qui s'appelle tout ça. Et ça, c'est pas des cailloux, euh, c'est pas des animaux, c'est pas d'autres humains, c'est un truc artificiel qui a des actions sur le, le monde, piloté euh, de manière consciente ou inconsciente par des humains. Euh, et donc, il y, y a une nouvelle entité qui vient d'arriver. Et maintenant, il faut réfléchir à une éthique de l'IA, pour avoir une IA éthique, c'est-à-dire une IA qui soit capable d'interagir avec les humains de manière satisfaisante et c'est à ça qu'il faut travailler maintenant parce qu'il y, nou y a une nouvelle entité qui n'est pas inanimée qui n'est pas animée euh, qui n'est pas et qui n'est pas humaine et voilà, il y a, a quelqu'un quelqu de nouveau dans le dans l'environnement le, dans no, no. Ok, and so my, my last comment because we were not, ok uh, Artificial intelligence no almost maybe a general artificial intelligence is also still sometimes incredibly stupid. And so that's why for me, it's incredibly dangerous. Uh, so yeah, how to avoid the of stupidity is difficult to, uh, there are many humans are, are very stupid. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are all incredibly stupid in, in some uh, aspects, but yeah. Okay. Uh, that's, that's maybe, yeah. Oh, David. So, so my book, The Singularity Principles, there are 21 principles in there, and I'm happy to say they are all ethical principles. They are principles about how we humans must behave as we are creating and deploying this technology. So they, create, they include things like reject opacity, which means don't accept things that we don't understand. That's uh, intolerable. It's making more problems. Includes things like promote auditability, which means that we can check what's going on rather than it being hidden. And it includes something that I called penalized disinformation, which is that when companies, when people in companies make false statements about the abilities of their software, when they make false claims about how well they've tested it, that should be a very serious matter. They should not get away with it. I did notice that the United Nations Secretary General had a better term for this. He didn't call it penalized disinformation. He said, 
we have to make lying wrong again. And I think unless we do that, we've got no hope of surviving in the next uh, troubled times ahead. So I offer you 21 singularity principles, and I agree, ethics absolutely needs to be accelerated in our discussion. It's no longer just a curious thing that you might get some points for in a philosophy class. It's a matter of the survival of the human species, whether we flourish or whether we, whether we fail. We need ethics to guide us. Vous nous présentez une entité, un être qui, euh, qui est différent de l'homme. Et l'éthique, effectivement, c'est la responsabilité. Moi, je ne comprends pas les, les choses qui se bousculent, les zéonaux transforment l'homme en objet. C'est la volonté, c'est l'initiative, c'est l'intention, c'est l'objectif. Qu'est-ce qu'on veut au bout du compte est, On engage une recherche qui veut voir comment on, on, on lire les pensées d'autrui dans son cerveau. Est qui c'est qui engage intentions. ça C'est l'homme. Ah oui, est, non, mais on ne peut pas nous dire. Euh... L'enfer est pavé de bonnes intentions et en ayant les meilleures intentions du monde, vous pouvez faire des choses qui sont les plus euh, terribles pour l'humanité. Donc en fait, malheureusement, il ne suffit pas de vouloir bien faire pour être sûr que l'on fait bien. Et. Pour la question, méfiez-vous de l'espoir. Euh, si vous êtes sûr, si vous ne voulez pas être déçu, n'espérez pas. Ok. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, David. Uh, David.